YouTube, it's Tone, back with another one for you. Now this one is a uh, continuation of the book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree. This shit is really an awesome book. It's got different um, affidavits that you can even use. We're going to go through a couple of them shits right now. Um, you know, you can copy and paste these, work them into whatever cases you got going on and shit like that too. So, But right here in this particular uh, slide, we're going to talk about how the bankers swindle you on a home mortgage. And then some shit, you know, a couple things that you can do. But look, listen, like this is not something that you just want to jump into without having done any work prior, like an administrative process and things like that, before you go jumping into like an affidavit or rescission or signature and shit like that. That's for like at the end when you know that they can't produce what it is that you need them to, and then you have every legal right to go ahead and back out of that illegal contract. You know what I'm saying? But you have to um, get the evidence prior to going and sending them something like this because you can get yourself into some bullshit that you're not ready for. And if you don't really know what you're doing, you can get yourself kicked the fuck out of your house. So just make sure you know what you're doing first. So, how the bankers swindle you on a home mortgage. Now, let's apply what we have just learned about money and banking to buying a home. Let us presume that after years of saving and months of looking, you finally find and select a home in which you want to raise your family in. Interest rates vary from bank to bank, so you must shop around until you find the best deal. We're all nervous when we sit down before the loan officer at the bank, but you have always paid your debts for years and have had excellent credit, so there should be no problem getting the loan. The loan officer calls you a week later with news that you are the new homeowner. You and the bank. <laughs> it says you and the bank here. And that's what it is, too, because the bank ends up kicking you out of your house legally on paper, and then you end up uh, becoming a tenant. So in a few weeks, you go to the scheduled closing, and are greeted with a mountain of papers in triplicate. Uh, after 45 minutes, you have finished the paperwork and the home is yours and the bank's. Now the hard part begins, paying for it. Your loan was for 85000 at 8.5% interest, agreeing to pay it back at 635 per month for the next 30 years. In the next 30 years, assuming that you earn 10 bucks an hour, 23,500 hours of your labor will go toward paying for that house. This works out to about 11 or 3 quarter years at 40 hours per week. This is the system of usury and all its evil glory, and this is how it works. Uh, what you did not know and would never have believed is that the bank just defrauded you. This is how they did it. As a typical bank customer, you presumed that the money you borrowed from the bank came from its depositors or investors. And I mean, look, so side note, a lot of people think that too, so don't, so don't feel stupid because even a lot of people who work in the bank really believe that they're lending out the fucking depositors money, which is 100% illegal. So you're not the only one that thought that. So that is what the bank wants you to believe, but that is not the truth. Before you took out the loan from the bank, that, that money did not exist. The bank took your loan application and renamed it a promissory note. The bank then took your promissory note and attached it to the title of the property using the home as collateral and the bank wrote a check. The moment the bank wrote a check, it created the money out of thin air. If you doubt that the bank is writing checks to create money using your promissory note as an asset, read the following again. In the Federal Reserve's bank's own words, bankers discovered that they could make loans merely by giving their promises to pay or bank notes to borrowers. In this way, banks began creating money. Now, personally, I don't really believe that this is a bad thing, just in general, but it obviously opens the window for discrimination uh, because, you know, who's who's keeping track of who the, of who these people are actually lending money to on a uh, demographic level and things like that. You know what I mean? So returning to our example, the bank made a check payable to the seller. The seller accepted the check and deposited deposited it back into the system. No armored cars ever delivered uh, money to anyone. And that's another crazy part, I mean, because I know people that have done some crazy shit for money, and I mean, to find out now that it was really just a fucking, this piece of paper, that shit is crazy. You know, people people get hurt for this, for this stuff. For cheap, too. Thousand bucks, people do something crazy for it. And it's all just fucking Monopoly money. 
So you believe the bank approved your loan because you are a splendid example of credit risk and would make good on your note or promise to pay. Actually, the bank doesn't give a fuck about where you, whether you keep your promises or not. After all, if you don't, they just foreclose and take you home. What, what took the bank moments to create will take you 23,500 hours of labor to pay it back. Your intellect should be telling you about now that there is something terribly wrong in River City. Now let's create a legitimate scenario for a moment and using the same numbers make the transaction honest. You want to buy a, you, you want to buy the same house on a land contract directly from the seller, you would pay the seller directly. You would exchange uh, of the home for money, be honest, yes. Would it be legal? Yes, of course it would be. Why? Because the home is a direct product of someone's labor. The money you exchange for the home has value because you exchange your labor for it. Unlike the first example with the bank, it was not something which you created out of thin air. When you exchange your labor for money, the money has value and substance. Because you exchange it for labor, uh, it is labor which gives value to the money. In this example, value for value is exchange. And what they're saying basically is that the bank um, really doesn't uh, do anything much other than uh, using your name to create uh, financial instruments. And then ultimately you get to be the one that works and, uh, and uses your labor to pay that shit off when they're not really, they're not, they're not really doing their, um, I forget what the exact word is called here, but we'll, we'll find it down here in the bottom because it's part of these contracts right here anyway. So financing a home through a bank can be an honest transaction. Years ago it was, but the bank must lend you money that, uh, that was either invested by its owners or placed on deposit by its customers. We are presumed when we borrow from a bank that this is where the money comes from. But it doesn't. But this is exactly what the bank is wanting you to believe. So the buyer, the contract, and the fraud. Okay, so the buyer, the contract, the fraud. So every contract must have six elements in order to be legally binding. If any one of these elements is missing, there is no legally binding contract. Number one, offer by person qualified to make the contract. So that's going to be like a binding officer, right? Which you always want to keep in mind whenever you have any correspondence with any of these individuals from any of these agencies. You want to send your correspondence directly to a binding agent so you have somebody to hold accountable. Not just to the company as a, as a whole or to the clerk or anything like that. It has to go directly to whoever it is that, you, that you're trying to uh, engage. Uh and always look at your correspondence as you hold in court. That is the sovereign court. It's held through the, through the mail. You don't have to walk into these people's buildings. You can default them out right from your house. You don't even got to go to their, to their building like that. So acceptance by party qualified to make and accept the contract. Number three, agreements, full disclosure, and complete understanding by both parties. Uh, did you know that when you took out a bank loan or used your uh, used a credit card, the bank was creating money out of thin air? If you didn't, then there was no full disclosure and complete understanding. Therefore, there is no legally binding contract. And so these are things to keep in mind. So. So things to keep in mind. So number four, consideration given. That was the word that I was looking for when, when I was just talking earlier about what the bank is not giving. Consideration, right? So they're making loans out of thin air essentially and then you have to work 43,000 hours to pay that back. And so they really have no skin in the game because even if you stop paying at any point, they'll just go ahead and foreclose on you and take the house back and all that shit. And really what did they... What did they put in, right? So when you borrow from a bank that created money out of thin air, there can be no consideration, no equal consideration, and there's no contract. So number five, every contract must have the element of time to make it lawful. Number six, all parties must be of lawful age, usually 21 years old or older. So your, so your remedy, so you have been lied to, cheated, and stolen from each and every time you borrowed money from the bank. If you want to help restore this country to a constitutional money system, then here is something practical that you might consider. You can sue every bank and credit card company that has ever stolen from you 
and force them to cancel your loans with respect to the credit cards and return all the money you have given to them. Some have taken the banks to court and had their mortgages canceled and kept possession of the home. This is the type of suit that will stop a foreclosure if the judge knows anything about law. And so the part, you know, but you're going to have to make sure that you know the law and that you're bringing that to the judge and serve that upon them in order to uh, be able to get any of this shit done. You can't just assume that they know the law just because they work in that, in that field, which is kind of fucking weird. But yeah, that's not something that you can just assume, to be honest. So make sure that you know the law and that you're bringing it to them. And then so once you serve that on them, then they can no longer move forward with the little game that they like to play with uh, plausible deniability that no longer exists. That little cloak is no longer there for them to hide behind. So here on the following pages are a few suggested letter samples that you might use to get the process started in removing the debt from your credit cards. A bank, by the way, is always in back of a credit card issue. This is what they're saying. All right, so bank manager. What is it? So this is to the to the bank manager. It has come to my to my attention after reading a publication titled Modern Money Mechanics published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago uh, Bank and other banks with the Federal Reserve System may be perpetrating a fraud on the American public. I have some questions which need to be answered before I continue to make payments on or use my type of bank credit card. My account number is XYZ. The following are my questions. Was an individual's depositor's money deposited used in order to pay for the vendors when I made charges to my account? Number two, was the money that was loaned uh, created by my signing of the voucher when I made the purchase? Number three, is it the bank's policy to create uh, checkbook money in amounts equal to the charges made by the bank's customers? Does, uh, does the bank have on file a contract signed by me with a bona fide signature? Number five. Will the bank provide a copy of the journal entry that is made when I when I charge to my account? Please answer these questions within 10 days so that I am not late in making my payments. If I do not hear from you, I will assume that what I have learned is the truth and therefore will rescind my contract with my name from the bank as I do not wish to be a party to these fraudulent practices. Thanking you in advance for your cooperation. I look forward to, to your immediate response to this utmost disturbing revelation my hope is that you can dispel my fears and refute this troubling circumstance in which we find ourselves. So that right there would probably be the first letter to go ahead and send them. And then uh, here we'll have the second letter. So I wrote you a letter on whatever the date was a copy of which is attached asking that you supply me with information regarding how the credit card company operates and how charges made by me are handled within your system. Uh, as of this date, my question remains unanswered. Since that writing, I have done an exhaustive amount of research regarding the subject matter of that letter has refused to answer my questions. I have taken this to mean that your bank is doing as other banks are loaning or creating credit on its books than using my debt as an asset of the bank. I am withholding any future payment based on your refusal to answer the questions contained in that letter. If you can, uh, if you can evidence to me that your bank can actu actually gave me or the vendors involved something other than electronic entries using my charge as a deposit on your books in order to create an electronic deposit to the vendor's accounts, checkbook money, then I will be willing to pay the balances due. In addition to my original request, I would also like you to provide me with the following information. A copy of your bank charter, the name of the board of directors. As I indicated in my first writings, I am in possession of a booklet published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago called Modern Money Mechanics. The booklet describes who creates money. Uh, please respond within 10 days with the information I have requested. Unless I hear from you refuting my stated facts, I will consider my account with you closed and this matter is settled. 
Please be sure to have the person replying, signing, and further correspondence under the penalty of perjury and send it only to the address exactly as it appears by certified mail. Thanking you in advance for your cooperation. Now, so what he's basically saying is that any answers from these people are going to have to be in the form of an affidavit under the penalty of perjury, which is how you should approach them at all times anyway. Because these people will say whatever the fuck that they want, but trust me, the, you know everything, everything changes when they have to put their ass on the line. They really don't even have anything to say, to be honest with you. Which really, I mean, what the fuck could they say? Anything would just fuck. <laughs> anything would be just digging a deeper hole for them. So, I mean, they really don't have any answers to any of these. So, don't fucking expect any. So, I would just be getting ready to sue them. If you start sending them shit like this, just get ready to sue them because they're not going to answer you back. So, affidavit or revocation of signature for cause. So comes now affiant having full first-hand knowledge of the facts herein and by making this affidavit of his own first-hand knowledge affirms that the facts stated herein are true and correct to the best of his knowledge and belief on or about the date you signed your credit card application. The affiant signed documents without knowledge that a fraud was being perpetrated upon the affiant. The affiant was coerced into signing documents without any knowledge that fraud was being perpetrated upon the affiant. The affiant's revocation of signature constitutes a rescission of signature, thus the contract no longer exists. Affiant hereby revokes and makes void all signatures for cause pursuant to UCC 3-3501. Now affiant is formally and timely removing the aforementioned signatures from all and, any, and removing any nexus, that means any uh, connections, that the credit card company may presume to have over the affiant by virtue of said signatures. So And so that means that all the accounts associated with your shit are gonna have to be fucking rescinded as well so and then also you're you're entitled to any of the benefits that were made from all the fraud that they that they perpetrated as well so you're gonna probably want to do a uh what do you call it forensic accounting have that done in order to get a good number of what it is that's going to be due you because you know even even after you guys go your go your separate ways they still owe you that wedding promissory sign uh the wedding promissory note they have to give that back to you and any money that they made using that as a security or whatever they used it for is going to is going to have to come back to you as well so just you know something to keep in mind so what else do we got here So right here, the third letter. So I am returning your correspondence, which is enclosed. This matter has been settled. Please reference the attached copies of my correspondence of the dates. To date, I have not received a satisfactory response to my questions asked to you within these letters. Uh, a complete response to you is necessary in order to comprehend a full understanding of my contractual relationship with your bank. In the absence of a satisfactory reply, uh, of, of a satisfactory reply, I have therefore concluded that the credit card company is operating fraudulently, fraudulently and has not loaned me anything but a liability. Until you prove to me that your bank has, has advanced to me a bank asset, I am under no obligation to repay the bank whatsoever or the credit card company has not fulfilled its contract with me. I know that your bank's record will show that it owes me an asset because what credit card company loaned me was created by my note to them. Uh, if the car company wants payments and like funds, I will be pleased to send you a promissory note, which is all that the credit card company ever gave me. I will consider this matter to be cl to be closed on your part also, unless the credit card company uh, truthfully answers my questions. Any further contact from you will be considered harassment and will be dealt with accordingly. If you have find it necessary to contact me, please do so by certified mail only at the address below exactly as it appears, and have the person supplying the answer signed under penalty of perjury. All other car correspondence will be refused, and that and phone calls will not be accepted. And you cannot be speaking to these people on the phone. Keep that in mind, because they're just going to say that you said some shit you didn't say, and they're going to say they said some shit that they fucking did not say. So everything has to be on paper. You want you want to have your evidence. Because keep in mind that all of these correspondence, um, correspondence that you're having with them is actually considered court. All right, paperwork is the is the court. So, I'm going to leave this here. We'll get back to a couple more. If you guys want this book, you can copy and paste all these two. Let me know. It's free, Cyberproductions369 at gmail.com. 
Again, it's a game of chess. Stop playing checkers with these clowns. That's what I got for you for now. Let's over meet again.